Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Scott Miller. Scott was recruited 25 years ago by Dr. Stephen R. Covey's team to work at Franklin Covey. He recently served as chief marketing officer there, which I love because my first book was all about CMOs. And he's now a senior advisor at Franklin Covey on thought leadership. He's the host of the podcast On Leadership with Scott Miller. He writes a column for Inc. Magazine. He's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and he's the author of the upcoming Marketing Mess to Brand Success, which I've got my advanced copy right here. But by the time this comes out, you'll probably be able to get your own copy. Scott, welcome to the show. Josh, thank you for the invite and the platform. I'm so excited to talk to you. There's so many things that you have experience with that are prime for this audience, entrepreneurs who want to learn how to write a book. But give us a little bit more background about yourself. Tell us a little bit about where you come from and what your work history is outside of Franklin Covey and how you got to this point where you're writing all these books on leadership. Sure. Well, I'm 53. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah with my wife and our three sons. I'm originally from Florida. I'm a, I'm a Florida boy, worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years. They invited me to leave, which is how they do it there when they fire you. So Disney kicked me out. And where does a single Catholic guy go from Orlando? Well, Provo, Utah, of course, where it's like the hip oh, of Catholic scene, right? Back <laughs> in the 90s. That was crazy. Joined the Franklin Covey Company, lived around the world, lived in Chicago for six years, lived in London for our office there was in sales and sales leadership for about 15 years, the CMO, the company's only ever CMO for about um, 10 years. And then I was interviewing someone on the podcast that I'm actually on the set for right now. That is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, which is about 7 million each week. And I was interviewing someone and I kind of had this epiphany where, you know what? I could write a book. I think I was 48 at the time, 49 maybe. And so I wrote my first book. It's behind me in blue called right there, Management Mess to Leadership Success. And it was basically kind of how difficult leadership is and not everybody should be a leader. So I shared 30 of my leadership challenges. The book did extraordinarily well. And the publisher then signed me to a 10-year, 10-volume series in the Mess to Success brand. So as you mentioned, Marketing Mess to Brand Success comes out in May, and then Job Mess to Career Success will come out in next January, followed by Communication Mess, Sales Mess, Parenting Mess, Relationship Mess, about 10 different editions over the next decade. You know, I've heard of authors taking on commitments to write three books, maybe four or five books. I've never talked to another author who committed to write 10 books. Well, (laughs) let me top that. Not only do I have 10 books going on in the marketing mess genre, but I write a book every year for HarperCollins called Master Mentors. That's a book launching in September where I take 30 of my favorite podcast guests every year and write a book about them. So I've got two 10-year books going on. I don't know if I'm bragging or confessing is probably more the option. Yeah, this sounds like some sort of addiction maybe. I'm speechless. I think you're right. Is this a ther- Is this therapy? Has my wife signed me up for a therapy session under the guise of a podcast? (laughs) It's all a trick. We're just here to help you out or help you to, this is an intervention. Thank you, doctor. (laughs) But yes, so 10 books, how did you feel making that type of commitment? And what made you feel like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to write these 10 books plus all the others I'm working on. Well, I feel honored, first of all, and I feel humbled that people bought the first book, Management Mess, The Leadership Success, and it struck a chord. So. It's almost, it's almost like, how can I not write it? How can I not share, you know, 30 years of my own career messes in the hopes that people coming up behind me or alongside me can benefit from my extraordinary access to all of these authors and this amazing brand that I've worked with. So for me, I don't want to say it's a duty, but it's an honor to do it. It's a big, it's a big task, right? I mean, my books are not good to great or war and peace. My books are breezy, they're fast, they're funny, they're real. They're fairly easy for me to write. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I interviewed Adam Grant this morning, right? The famous psychologist from, from um, the Wharton School. He wrote, um, Think Again. My books are not Adam Grant's, right? But my books serve a purpose, and I feel humbled and honored to be able to write them and that readers and publishers believe in me. 
Fantastic. Now, did writing the books, let's see, when did you start? When did you write your first book? So I'm 53 now. My book launched not quite two years ago. So summer of 2019 was my first book. I've published two since then and have three more coming out this year. So five books in three years. And when did the transition from being the CMO at Franklin Covey to this advisor role over thought leadership, when did that transition happen? It happened about two years ago. I was reading Liz Wiseman's book, Multipliers. I think it's the best leadership book ever written. Had her on the program and I realized, oh my gosh, I am an accidental diminisher. I am not a multiplier. And honestly, I stepped down. The CEO asked me to stay in the job three times. Like, you know what, Bob? This is enough time. I stepped aside to do another executive role in the company. But I stepped away from the CMO role kind of in the middle of me writing this book. The first one. Gotcha. So it was related. There was a connection there between the there writing was. and there was a, roles. Yeah, there was a self-disruption that was very intentional going on in my career. And I was turning 52, 51 at the time. And you know, I, I have since actually um, retired from my full-time role with Franklin Covey. I'm now a consultant and advisor on a contract. And as an officer in a public company, I wasn't able to do some things I wanted to do as an officer. So I, I had a great departure with the CEO and the board. And here I am still at Franklin Covey today, taping this podcast because we're in great standing, but it allows me some latitude to do some things on my own I wanted to do with the company's blessing that I couldn't have done as an officer in a public firm. Now, Franklin Covey is well known for leadership. Of course, those of us who are a little bit older, I mean, the kids won't understand, but Franklin Covey got big because of paper planners. And I've got a couple of those still with all my notes and everything and ABC and all that uh, stuff. And they're huge and they're heavy. And today, Franklin Covey seems to be more about leadership training than it is about organization and productivity. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's very right. We really gained our influence on two things simultaneously. The, the, the planning process, the planning tool from the Franklin Quest company and the seven habits of highly effective people from the Covey company. They merged in 97. And then about a decade later, the company completely divested ourselves of all the retail stores, of the planning tools, if you will, and became an organizational performance improvement consulting company solely about a decade ago. We, we, we almost exclusively reach all of our individuals through organizational performance. And thought leadership is a subsection of leadership. What is the role of thought leadership in the Franklin Covey empire these days? Yeah, it's, it's, I liken it to the new public relations. You know, gone are the days where you're issuing press releases and trying to get a reporter to cover you. There are no more reporters. There's no newsrooms. They're gone, right? The Salt Lake Tribune is now on Sundays only. Uh, you can't even get the Wall Street Journal in Utah printed anymore. It doesn't come. So thought leadership is really the megaphone that I'm responsible for holding up and sharing our unique point of view on our topics like strategy execution, productivity, time management, building a high trust culture, leadership development, sales performance. My job is to make sure that our podcast, our books, our articles, our columns, our keynote speeches our appearances are pointed and aimed at the right individual that's interested in learning from our expertise. So our job, the team that I lead, is to make sure that our thought leadership is, is targeted at and consumed by the people who need it. So how often do you get in a conversation with an executive there at Franklin Covey and they're talking about thought leadership and you say, you know what, you need to write a book? Never. <laughs> Never. That's not your job. That's not kind of well. I mean, occasionally, right? I mean, we have a we have a book pipeline that is about three to four years out, as you know. Any solid book takes you a good year to year and a half minimum to write, and then about another year to launch. Like the books that are coming out in twenty twenty three, they've already been written and decided for most publishing houses, right? So, and then the bigger book, the bigger the book the longer it takes to write. Brendan Bouchard is a good friend of mine, and he takes about three to four years to write his book, spends a million dollars on research. Tony Robbins, who I don't know personally, but we share the same literary agent, he usually has three ghostwriters working at any given time simultaneously helping him. 
So for us, we're very strategic in how we launch our books, usually in alignment with one of our solutions. And then occasionally, I will look at maybe the CEO or someone and say, should we write a book about that? And they'll usually say, yes, but I don't want to write that book, find someone else. Because it takes a lot, as you know, to write a book and then even more to publicize it. Writing a book is about 20% of the process of publishing a book. I'll do Tell about 120, a bit. I'll do 125 podcasts just for this book alone. Incredible. So tell us a little bit more about that. What's the 80, other 80%? For those who are listening to this, entrepreneurs, they're thinking about becoming a first-time author. What do yeah. they need to know about the book writing, book publishing process, and that other 80% that might yeah. be a mystery to them? I, mean, I could talk a long time about this. I'll try to keep it short. First of all, don't let anybody talk you out of your book. Yes, the world needs your book if your book is good. So, so if you've got a book in you, get it out of you. The first question I would ask, though, is why are you writing the book? Is it because you want to give a memoir to your children? It's because you want to go become a speaker. You want to build your brand. Do you want to go become a, you know, a, a consultant? Because no one's going to make money on books. It's like you know, the upper 1% is making money on books. So first is be very clear on your why. Sounds like a cliche, but it is the most important thing, right? And then decide what is your book writing process. For me, I use post-it notes. So I sit in my, in my office and put post-it notes up on my wall and organize them in colors and themes. And I start to write books every morning from 4 a.m. to 5.30. Every day, 4 a.m. to 5.30, nonstop till it's done. That's my writing process. I think not everybody needs a literary agent. If you know, you know someone in the business, but if you don't find one, by the way, every publisher is always looking for new books. So don't feel like you should be embarrassed or walk on eggshells. Every publishing house is always looking for new authors and new books. In the fiction world, your book should be done. In the nonfiction world, it's enough to kind of have an idea and an outline. It's a very different world. But I think the key to all successful book launches are two things. One, write a good book. And then two, you got to build your social media. You know, most publishers won't even speak to you if you don't have 50,000 Instagram followers and 100,000 YouTube subscribers and you've maxed your LinkedIn and maxed your Instagram and your Facebook. You've got to build a social media. And too many authors say, yeah, I don't want to play that game. Then you're not going to sell a book. That's like, that's like you're saying, not in the game. You're not in the game. I, I don't believe in billboards or radio or TV. You've got to get over your stigma around social media. There is no book promotion without social media. So have a martini, throw a dinner plate in the garage, whatever you got to do, get over your social media phobia, and it'll take you two years minimally to build your social media. And then I think your whole idea is what are you going to do to launch the book? Because don't mistake your publisher for anything more than they are. Your publisher increasingly rarely pays you in advance. They edit your book, they print your book, and they distribute your book, meaning they get it from the printing company to Amazon's warehouse, to Barnes & Noble's distribution system through probably Ingram. But don't mistake printing and distributing your book for marketing your book. Your publisher does not market your book. Now, they might do this here and there, some SEO searcher, get it on walmart.com to compete against Amazon if you're lucky for a pricing war. You might get that if you have a genius publisher. But 95% or more of all the marketing comes from you. Podcasts, webinars, speeches, keynotes, your website, your social media, sending out galley copies to anybody and everybody, messaging every high school girlfriend, every former professor who hated you, in college, everybody, everybody, working tirelessly to build your book. That is your job as the author. You are the promoter. Now you've got your successful podcast. You've got social media. What are some other parts of your platform that have been especially valuable for you when it comes to marketing your books? Well, so keep in mind, I don't market my books through the podcast because the podcast is owned by Franklin Covey. And some of my books are theirs and some are my own, right? So for example, Marketing Mess to Brand Success, I own this book. You will never hear me speak about it on Franklin Covey's podcast because that's not appropriate. 
But I mentioned, I think, I just think all things come, all things come down to your social media because that is the megaphone. You need to have an email database, right? I, I will send messages to all of my connections on LinkedIn in the hopes that they'll be interested in the book. But keep in mind, I've been nurturing that for years, right? With weekly articles that I've written for LinkedIn, for my Inc. column. I write an article for another business, business magazine in Utah. I post two and three times a day in my social, putting the spotlight on others, making sure I'm an abundant contributor. So I nurture my social media extremely methodically, hopefully abundantly and generously. I have an opt-in email database. I have websites for all of my books and all of my products and tools. I also develop derivative products. So for example, like the book, I have a card deck. So for every content I teach, I have card decks that I use for keynote speeches. I'm involved with speakers bureaus. I'm constantly out evangelizing my book on podcast as, as a participant. So depending on the kind of book, your strategy might be different, but I've got a 25 point plan to launch my book. And I'm tirelessly building Facebook ambassador groups, right? And launching other people's books for them so that they'll give me the same treatment when my books launch. It is, um, I, I probably spent 150 hours writing Marketing Mess. I'll spend 2,000 hours publishing Marketing Mess. That 25 point plan, that sounds pretty interesting. You could write a book about that too. You know, I could absolutely write a book about how to launch a book. And it would all be focused on, it is your responsibility to build a plan that is relevant for the industry, relevant for the month, the year, the day when you're launching it. And uh, it would all come down to what are your goals for launching the book, right? Because everybody's go everybody has different goal for the book. A lot of people want to write a book and think they're going to make a ton of money. No, you're going to make about maybe if you're lucky, $3 a book. That's a lot of books, right? Kind of like opening a donut shop. You got to sell a lot of donuts to make any money. Yep. So how do you benefit from your books then? If you're not really making money off the book sales, how does yeah. it benefit you? Well, so I, everybody again has different motivations, right? So from an economic standpoint, yes, I'll make some money off the books, but for me, it's primarily keynoting, right? It is, it's kind of hard to be a credible keynoter without a book behind you. And so for me, from an economic standpoint, the revenue upside is generally in keynoting live and virtual conferences, company events, sales kickoffs, industry associations, things like that. I write these books because like I said, when I opened up, I'm humble and grateful that people want to consume my wisdom, mainly from my mistakes, not from my successes. So my primary motivation is to give back and to educate others. Watch out for that pothole, walk around that pothole because I'm sitting in that pothole, right? From an economic standpoint, for me, it's mainly around keynote speeches and also derivative products, right? I sell a lot of tools like this and card decks, and I have a coaching series online called Ignite Your Genius. And so for me, I'm building a multi-decade brand that has a lot of different touch points in it from my experience. But it's the advice I give every, every author, Josh, is be very clear on your why. Because your, be, your why might be to build a brand for your consulting company. Your why might be to share your story just because you want to give back. Your why might be you want to sell books to develop a speaking career. It's the really first question everyone should be very clear on because then your book should be written to support that motivation. Has your why changed since you wrote your first book? No, not really. Uh, I'm in, I'm in, uh, knock on wood in great demand for speaking because not all authors have a stage presence, right? For what I lack perhaps in intellectual gravitas in my books, I make up for real life application that I can bring alive in a way that connects to an audience on a stage or virtual. But no, my why is the same. My why is probably two is to share my knowledge with others and earn a living. And, I, and I'm unabashedly not ashamed of that, right? I don't, I don't ever apologize for having my top professional value be to earn income. I'm the sole provider for four people who are dependent upon me financially. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And I hope that the way I earn money is being seen as credible and ethical and value add to others. People are willing to pay money for your knowledge. And I'm happy to tap into that. 
Now you have a lot of books on the shelf behind you for those who are listening. What do you think it, uh, yeah. And on the sides too, (laughs) that wraps the room. (laughs) How important is it for a writer, for an author to also be a reader? I couldn't imagine you could write without being a voracious reader. I mean, I've read all these books behind me. There's hundreds of them. I, uh, you know, I'm not the smartest cat in the world, right? I've had, a, I've had a decent education and I've had a great professional experience, but my books are not you know, empirically researched. They're not meant to be. They're meant to be experiential. And this is what I suffered from. And much of my knowledge is as an aggregator. So mo- if you read my books, Dan Pink taught me this. Seth Godin taught me that. Doris Kearns Goodwin taught me this. Liz Wiseman taught me that. So most of my books are me sharing ideas and lessons that I have learned from others, whereby I give them credit and I talk about how that lesson has worked in my life or how I struggled against it or failed. So at heart, I'm an aggregator and I unabashedly admit that I'm proud of that. And to answer your question, it's been instrumental. Could not imagine writing a book without being a voracious reader and learner, because I don't know who it was. Was it Winston Churchill? Or someone said, I'm going to slaughter this. You can only think as deep as your vocabulary is broad or something like that. That sounds pretty not, good. And if you're not reading, how else do you build your vocabulary? Yeah. Now, at Franklin Covey, you've been surrounded by some great leaders. Uh, before we started recording, we were talking about Blaine Lee and his book, The Power Principle. I'm good friends with one of Blaine Lee's sons, and you worked with Blaine Lee directly. You also, of course, worked with Stephen R. Covey before he passed away. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned firsthand from some of these great leaders who have come through Franklin Covey? I am delighted you asked me that. Dr. Blaine Lee was one of the founders of the Covey Leadership Center. He wrote the book behind me in blue called The Power Principle. Next to the book that I co-authored, Everyone Deserves a Great Manager. Of all the things that Blaine Lee, who passed about maybe 13 years ago, 12 years ago, he said something that I've heard many times, but I think it's profound. It's nearly all, if not all, conflict in life comes from mismatched or unfulfilled expectations. I I think that is just absolutely piercingly insightful. Think about the conflict in your life and how often has it come because you didn't declare your intent. You didn't move outside your comfort zone. You didn't discuss the undiscussables and get clear on what you would or would not offer someone else, what you can and cannot expect from someone else. Dr. Covey said so many wise things. You can't talk yourself out of a problem you've behaved yourself into. He shared that you build trust with those who are present when you are loyal to those who are absent. He also shared this concept that I struggle with daily, and that is with people, fast is slow, and slow is fast. You cannot be efficient with people. You can be efficient with taking out the garbage, washing your car, mowing your lawn, sending some texts, posting some social things, but you can only be effective in relationships because an organization's most valuable asset are not its people. It's not true. People are not a company's most valuable asset. It's the relationships between those people that is what's irreplaceable, irreplicable. You can't replicate it in a culture. So I've learned a lot from, I've learned almost everything I know from my 25 years at Franklin Covey. It's been a blessing. There's some great takeaways here for authors who are developing content and trying to form a connection and relationship with their readership. There are. I I think as an author, you have to have an inherent abundant mentality. You cannot be a scarce thinker and hoard information because I think you're going to want to ask people, can I write about you in your book? Because you got to get their permission. You cannot write about someone without their permission. True or not, especially if you're working for a company. And so you want to be able to pull on people's research and share their examples. You want them to become your champion. You want them to endorse your book and promote your book and exchange you promoting theirs. So I think there's a significant basis of reciprocity that comes in writing a book that's grounded in having an abundance mentality. I really do have a feeling that we could talk for hours about this and it would be 
fascinating to listen to some of the lessons you've picked up. Let's change tax a little bit and let's talk about your book that is coming out soon, Marketing Mess to Brand Success. Now, what's the release date for this? May 11th in hardcover. It's available on, on Amazon and all the retail sites now for pre-order. Awesome. So if you're listening to this, you can pre-order it right now. You can probably, by the time this comes out, you'll probably be able to actually go order the hard copy. Why was this the next book in the series that you wrote? Well, I think the publisher and I reviewed five or six different topics that I had experience and passion, mistakes, messes around. And you know, I just come off this decade-long tenure as the chief marketing officer and executive vice president of thought leadership. And I had a very successful run. I'm extraordinarily proud of the role that our team of almost 35 people at, in the marketing division had had. I was privileged to lead a team of insanely competent, trustworthy people. And I found that there was a great need in organizations to help other marketers build a career for themselves, how to understand what is the role marketing plays in a private company, in a public company, in a not-for-profit, in a solopreneur, entrepreneurial setting. How does marketing coexist with sales? I'm not a big sports fan, but you know, being from Utah, I know the jazz well, and I liken marketing to the famous jazz duo Carl Malone and John Stockton. You always heard that Stockton to Malone. And I, always, I very much see marketing as John Stockton and sales as Carl Malone. And for those of you who are old enough to know, there was that famous maneuver, I guess, you know, Stockton to Malone. John Stockton's job, in many cases, was to set Carl Malone up at the net. And I may have that partially right or partially wrong, but I very much see marketing in a support role helping sales. I think too many marketers focus on creativity and their outlets and building brand only and numbers of impressions. Last time I checked, Josh, you cannot staple brand to the back of a deposit slip for the bank. Brand is enormously important, but marketers have got to be attached to revenue and cash in the bank, the lifeblood of every company. So I wanted to take my sales experience and my executive office experience as a C, as a C level officer and help marketers become really relevant and by learning some of the lessons that I've, you know, either succeeded or failed in. So for me, naturally coming off the CMO role, CMO role, marketing mess was next. Are there any of these principles or lessons from the book that you would say are particularly relevant for authors, for entrepreneurs writing a book and yes, yeah. trying to get that out? Yeah. Number seven, and this is the card deck I mentioned. If you actually pre-order the book and go to marketingmessbook.com. I'll email you a digital copy of the deck. You also can buy them there and print. But uh, challenge seven is bruise hard and heal fast. And I think that's so important. Uh, you need as an author, not just to surround yourself with people who love you and adore you and validate you. You need a circle of critics. You need people who are challenging you that say, that chapter sucks, or that's a good idea, but you didn't take it where I thought you should take it. Don't just write your book in a vacuum of people that adore you and love you. That's not helpful. You need to build a circle of challengers, people who disagree with you, who perhaps don't like you or don't like your writing style, and then take their point of view or leave their point of view. But it's important to hear it. So I think bruise hard and heal fast. And here's challenge 13. This one is called more is not better. Better is better. More is not better. Better is better. Do not as an author fall into the trap where your publisher has given you a, well, you got to have 55,000 words. BS. Let me tell you something. No one wants to read 55,000 words. It's why, Josh, the last half of every book sucks because most authors only have about 35,000 words in them. So they phone the second half in with filler. It's why most of us only finish the first half of books. Write the book and then stop. And if your book is 34,000 words, then so be it. You're seeing books be shorter and shorter. Now there are some thresholds on how many words you need to also tape an audio book. I think it's 35,000 words. And you should know that because audio books are on a steep rise right now Book print and digital are about flat. They're very strong. Book sales in general are very robust across the world. Audio is on a hockey stick right now. But 
more is not better. Better is better. You write the book that you think your readers need and don't write a single word more. And you find the right publisher who believes in that book at that size. So good. So Scott, you were saying that you wake up every morning, you write for an hour and a half. Are there times when you just don't want to do that? Are there times when you sit down to write and you get stuck, you get writer's block? How do you push through that? Yes, because I'm human. Here's a great example. Now, this one was a little bit unusual. I woke up at 2.30 this morning. I, I couldn't sleep. I had so many projects. So I woke up unusually at 2.30. Usually it's about four. I woke up at four, but let me, let me tell you, I crash at 9.30. I am asleep at 9.30 every night, provided my boys are in bed. This morning, I wake up at 2.30, and I'm writing a book for HarperCollins that is a soft cover book. And in soft cover books, you don't have the benefit of having the jacket that has the flaps that fold in. So there are some soft cover books that have what, were, what are called French flaps. And a French flap are the, is when the soft cover book folds in and provides you the flaps. Well, the, I have a book for HarperCollins, and today it was due to the publisher all of the text for both inside of the French flaps. So I spent from 2.30 to 4 writing all the content for these for the French flaps. I send it off. I'm so proud of myself. It's 4 o'clock. I'm going to get my day started. I get a call from the editor about 8 this morning. I'm on my way to the studio to take the podcast. And he calls. And I'm super busy. I'm like, I can't talk. He's like, I got a problem. What's that? Thank you for the content for the French flaps this morning. But you wrote it for an entirely different book. And I tell you, I spent an hour and a half this morning writing content for a different book I'm writing for this book. And for an hour and a half, I didn't realize that. So you've got so many book projects going on. You're writing that's content. That's the point, right? Your books. More is not better. <laughs> better is better, Miller. Take your own medicine. So I think it's important that you write when you should write. Dan Pink in his book, um, When popularize the concept of knowing your circadian cycle, right? Your peak, your trough, and your recovery. And my peak is usually about 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. That's when my energy is highest. I tend to trough from 10 to 2 and recover from about 2 to 6 or so. So my advice to your listeners and viewers is, what is your peak? What is your trough? And what is your recovery? And write in accordance with that. Some people write best in the evening. Some write best on the weekends away from their family in a cabin somewhere. Everyone's got a different process. Find your own. So talking about writer's block again, have you gotten stuck ever for an extended period of time? And how did you break through it? I did. I, I, and I had it until recently. I owed a book to a publisher and I literally had to put it away for about six weeks. It, I'm Catholic. It haunted me. The guilt. I was missing the deadlines. I had to call and grovel and beg, and they had to push the deadline. Because, you know, publishers, like I said, have these books planned years out, and it involves shelf space and distribution. And post-COVID, printing books is a problem now. A lot of the printers went belly up. So actually, it's not hard to get your book distributed. It's hard to get a book physically printed right now. Don't let anybody tell you print books aren't popular. Print books are wildly popular. They're just less important to Amazon than the 80,000 cappuccino machines they'll sell today. So Amazon's way backed up on their print books. But yeah, I, had a, I, I just came clean. I called up my author and said, I'm not feeling it. I, guess I, I need a break from this. And they were very generous to me. This is not a new thing to them. Writer's block is a real thing. And for everyone, it's different, right? For some, you may have to completely check out. For some, you may have to you know, go on a vacation. For some, you may have to read some books and get regenerated, rejuvenated. But it's very real. It will happen. And just move through it. Might take you longer than you, than you like, but it, writer's block should be more like writer's... What's the word? Not block, like writer's mud, right? <laughs> you're you're going to move through it. It's going to be dirty, but it's not going to stop you it might just stall you and then refocus you. For you, was it a burnout type of thing? You were just, I'm just tired. I just don't want to do it. Or was it a hang up where you were like, I'm writing this and something's wrong and I've got to figure it out before I can proceed? Yeah, in insightful of you. Uh, total burnout. I'd written half the book and uh, I was writing two books simultaneously, not to mention, you know, 
a vast list of other life obligations. And I just needed to step away from it for about six weeks. I did, came back roaring, finished the book off in under three weeks over the Christmas holidays. Was super proud, am super proud of this book that will come out in about, in about nine months from now called Master Mentors. And I needed to step away. To, 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 I had spread myself too thin and it was, I hate to admit it, it was sapping my creativity and it, it was more of a chore than a joy. If your book is a chore, it will show. It will read as such. If your book is a gift and a joy, it will show. It will read as such. Yeah, I mean, writing multiple books at the same time, it's kind of like training for multiple physical events, like a marathon and a triathlon and something else all at the same time. Yeah, I would recommend it. But for me, it has worked, generally speaking. Uh, I'm writing two more books starting in about two months. I will write them simultaneously because they're very different books on different topics, right? One is going to be Job Mess to Career Success. The other will be Master Mentors Volume 2. They're very different books. Uh, but I usually do fits and starts, right? I'll work on one for 10 days and stop it, and then work on another for 10 days and stop it. I still think about it, but it isn't like I spend 45 minutes writing one and then 40 minutes writing another. I tend to go on a journey and then unpack and go on a different journey for the different books. So I once heard an author say that the best marketing tool for their book was their next book. As somebody who's written multiple books, do you see the truth of that? That makes sense to me. But you know, not everybody's got multiple books in them, right? And I don't think you have to. I think you, I, my advice would generally not do what I do, is that I would get really focused on the book you're writing. I have the privilege, like you, of interviewing some pretty phenomenal guests, me excluded. And they all do share one thing in common, the big names, the Dan Pinks, the Seth Godins, the Liz Wiseman's, the Rachel Hollis's, they're usually the Ryan Holidays. They're usually obsessed on the book that they're writing. And they don't know what's next. They have an inkling, but they usually write furiously for a year or two. They launch for nine months. And then literally they do nothing for four or five months. They repair, they heal, they rejuvenate. They cogitate, they explore, and then something starts to come in their mind and they kind of start to validate it. And then they're on to the next project. So I think, again, it's just a, it's, it's a different facet for everyone. I think, here's what I would leave you with on this thought. I think too many of us, including me, spend too much time studying other people and we don't spend enough time studying ourselves. And when you spend time studying yourself, you know where you find joy, where you find energy, where you deplete, where you infuse. You know how you will write best. Study yourself. Get to know your own style and needs and distractions and focal points. Study others less. I think that's a great place to wrap things up. Scott, if people want to learn more about you, where can they go? Josh, thank you for asking. Uh, ScottJeffreyMiller.com, go figure, is my website. You can visit that. All my books are there. The Ignite Your Genius coaching series is there, 14 modules you can sign in and subscribe to. You also can visit the site for this new book, MarketingMessBook.com. Great. Thanks so much for being with us here today, Scott, and sharing all this wisdom. It's been fantastic. Josh, thank you for the spotlight, man. Nice meeting you. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 